wherever they have a sense that there is money in whichever industry that is legal or illegal, they're gonna try to bank on it. At some point, drugs were the most profitable revenue, right? Because they were illegal, hard to get, scarce, and there was a huge demand in the US. They're still making money out of, out of drugs. But the thing is, that's sort of like a established revenue stream now, right? They managed to have that streamline of revenue established. No issue, no problem. They can even sort of like calculate how much money they're gonna make over a year of shipping different kinds of drugs and stuff. So that's basically settled for them, for their business. There was a time like maybe 10 years ago when there were still drug organizations that they would get money from a politician to let them alone and let them work and, and you know, like transit drugs through their city or stuff like that. So they pay the politicians. They used to pay politicians, they used to you know, like bribe politicians basically. Mm -hmm. So like, okay, I'm gonna, so that was not an income, that was an outcome, you know, that was this, like, okay, I'm losing money to pay politicians, still allow me to keep making money. Now it's the other way around. Now they have controlled the whole country. And now they're saying like, we had elections. If you're not stepping out, I'm gonna leave you out of the equation by killing you and setting up my own people. So now they're setting up their own people, their own majors, their own governors, their own chief of police. So they don't have to pay them anymore. So they're like, okay, you don't like it, I'm gonna kill you. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set you up as a governor of this state and we're gonna do business, both of us. You're gonna give me all contracts for construction, for road work, for building government buildings, all the contracts, well, imports, exports, all of the government contracts, you're gonna give them to me. I'm gonna handle that. And that's making them tons of money. They were not still that powerful back then. There were still like cartels. I don't even call them cartels anymore. They're either criminal enterprises or pseudo paramilitary armies, you know? Yeah. Everything but drug cartels. I think that's a term that it's absolutely outdated. We, we shouldn't be calling them drug cartels because they're not drug cartels. Mexican cartels have officially gone legit. The fortunes of cartels may have started by doing illegal stuff, but now they're taking over the country's legitimate industries too. And nothing is off the table. The US is saying Mexico owes us like five years of water. They haven't paid. And Mexico is like, we are on a draft. We don't have enough water to pay you back. And we need that water for our locals. Cartels learned about this. They say like, so water is money now. So we want to control every river, creek, lake, at least in the region we own. The lines are getting so blurred that it's getting really hard to tell the difference between the Mexican cartel and the Mexican governments. They're becoming one and the same. But none of us should be surprised, because the exact same thing happened not too long ago right here in the good old US of A. It's January 17, 1920 in America. Prohibition had just gone into effect, alcohol is officially illegal, and the people are losing their minds. They need their liquor no matter how much it costs. So guess what? The only people that were willing to meet this demand were the ones who were willing to break the law. And just like that, a super profitable black market for bootleggers emerged. Bootleggers made a multi-million dollar fortune, selling people the one thing they wanted the most. But once prohibition was over, they couldn't just go back to their regular lives as suckers. So they used that alcohol money to expand into other rackets. Protection rackets, prostitution, brothels, drug trafficking, fraud. You name it, they used their alcohol money to get into it. And thus the American Mafia as we know it today was born. Eventually, five families, the most powerful Italian Mafia families in America would emerge. And as they grew, they would come to infiltrate almost every aspect of American society trucking, labor unions, all the way to American politics. And once they had more money than they knew what to do with, they would start to work their way into legitimate businesses. It got so bad that the average person wouldn't be able to tell if a business was legit or mafia run. Eventually, the American government was able to crack down on them. But other countries aren't so lucky. In Japan, the Yakuza rose to power because gambling was illegal. So they provided illegal gambling services. And then they took that gambling money and got into every other racket you can imagine. And once they had more money than they knew what to do with, they would also venture into the world of legitimate businesses as well. They got into real estate, the stock market, startup investments, and working with international companies. The Yakuza basically became a giant quasi-hedge fund with $100 billion in their pocket. How do you beat that? The answer is you don't. These days, the Yakuza is so deeply embedded in Japanese society that you can't really even distinguish between a Yakuza member and a businessman, because many times they are one and the same. And all of this was because of one thing. Prohibition. See, whenever you make something illegal, you empower the most vicious men of society. And if you prohibit something long enough, this will always be the end outcome. And now it's Mexico's turn. But unlike Japan and America, Mexico isn't some rich country with a thriving economy that can at least balance out this organized crime. 
Now, the cartels have already started controlling all of Mexico's most valuable resources. Food, natural resources, transportation companies, and even the water supply is under their influence. While millions of everyday Mexicans are forced to work directly or indirectly for the cartel in some capacity. That Mexico, that the cartels are the fifth largest employers in Mexico, right below the Mexican government. So I guess Mexico needs to find a way to legitimize all that dirty money, all that, you know, money made with dirty hands, put it into a legal, basically launder money for these guys and then stop the revenue and, and opening up more, I don't know, man, shops or whatever. And now they're coming from the Mexican government too. And at this point, there may be nothing anyone can do to stop them. They went from small organization to get earning social bases, to getting funding, to trying to destabilize government, to trying to delegitimize de government, trying to step in and now teaching official tactics to their people, you know? Back then was like, just get a AK and let's start shooting. Now they have uniforms, military uniforms with Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generacion here, CJNG. Stay dangerous, subscribe for more, and say hello to the failed state of Mexico. These cartels have a lot of money. And if you want more money, one of the easiest ways to save an extra $300 a year right now is to cancel pay subscriptions that you don't use anymore. This is because the average person is gonna waste $300 on unused subscriptions this year. Which is why I use today's sponsor, Rocket Money. Rocket Money is an all-in-one finance platform that helps you save more and spend less. This personal finance app allows you to manage subscriptions, lower bills, build a custom budget, and grow your savings all in one place. For me, I love using Rocket Money to view all my subscriptions all in one place and to cancel the ones I don't use anymore. Another favorite feature of mine is that you can connect your bills or upload receipts of your bills and their negotiators will work to lower your bills for you. You just pay them a portion of whatever they save you. This means you can reduce your cell phone bills, cable bills, or even lower your car insurance without lifting a finger. Plus, Rocket Money helps you track your net worth. So to save more and spend less, join over 5 million members using Rocket Money today. Go to rocketmoney.com slash jake or click the link below to get started for free. You can also unlock even more features with Premium. That's rocketmoney.com slash jake to get started for free. In the 1980s and 90s, the US government was cracking down hard on the Italian mafia. At the same time, the Colombian cartels were starting to disintegrate thanks to America taking out their Caribbean smuggling networks. And now that all the main sources of these illegal products were disappearing, smuggling them into the US became a major black market business opportunity. And one new criminal organization just couldn't wait to take advantage of it, the Mexican cartels. Unlike the Colombians, the Mexican cartels didn't have to worry about crossing an ocean to get their product into America. All they had to do was slip it past a simple land border, easy. And with their main competitors gone, the Mexican cartels quickly took over the movement of illegal products into America. And since this wasn't just one big cartel, but a bunch of smaller ones who regularly fought against each other, even though smuggling made them rich, they also had to deal with a lot of violence and bloodshed. The Sinaloa cartel, the Juarez cartel, were by far two of the biggest. And they were making bank, flooding American markets with every kind of illicit substance you could think of. But eventually, these big Mexican cartels just had too much money. And I mean, come on, personal finance 101, if they let the cash sit there, it's just gonna lose value. So they started looking for legitimate investments to pour all their cash into. Cartels gotta invest too. And what was their target? Mexico's avocado industry. For years, Mexico had been supplying American millennials with the key ingredient for their avocado toast and guacamole. And now the cartel wanted a piece of the action. Avocados are green gold. So first they went to avocado farmers and threatened to kill them and their families if they didn't start paying the cartels a protection fee. And when that wasn't enough, they just took control of the farms altogether and became the suppliers themselves. It's a, war. a favorite food for Canadians has become a cash crop for merciless Mexican cartels. Everything that produces money, they're going to be interested in. Unleashing a reign of terror on any who oppose them. Regular people are the ones who suffer the violence. You are a very powerful organization. These guys just understand blood. But avocados are just one of the Mexican cartel's many legitimized businesses. They also invested in the mining industry. The cartels offered these valuable mining operations protection in exchange for a piece of the pie. And by protection, they meant you and your loved ones get to live another day. That really boosted their revenue. Then they moved from that to other revenue streams. One of them being uh, mining. First, they started embedding with my international mining companies to bring security. Even if those mining companies I've reached out to, they say they have no clue. They don't do that kind of like deals with cartels and they disguise everything as going with private security companies. Well, guess what? 
private security companies they, they are, right? They're, they are curtailed. But even that didn't feel like enough. Merely taking a cut of a business's profits was just too short-sighted for a cartel like theirs. They didn't just want a measly protection racket, they wanted to own the mining industry, to own the avocado farms. So the cartel basically owns the security around most of these mining companies uh, on, on different natural resources, right? That was first the beginning. Then cartels start and saying like, oh, you know what? It looks like we have rumors that here could be a lot of new silver unexploded yet. Why don't we establish right there and, and hold that place for a while? So when a mining company comes and says like, hey, want to explode that place, we're already here, man. Yeah, you're going to have to, you know, give us the good money to keep you safe, to get rid of all these people, and, and we're good. And, and that's, been, that's been going on and on in different places. Which brings us to today. Mexican cartels are everywhere. And they're not just killing people over funny vitamins and flour anymore. Instead, they're murdering regular civilians for stuff like avocados and natural resources. When we see cartels fighting, like in places like Zacatecas, Puebla, all that stuff, the government tells us, oh, they're fighting a drug route. And it's like, dude, that is, that, that is not even a drug route. There, there is no port. There is no main highway that leads to the U.S., whatever. Not the only one. That's not a production site. But what you have is a lot of silver like in Zacatecas. So these guys want to own that place because they know there's going to be a new project coming in town. And that's big money for them. Big money. When Mexico was going through a drought a few years back, the value of water shot up overnight. And within days, the cartel pounced on the opportunity and turned its focus from big crown to big water almost immediately. I, I was there during a, during a drought, right? One of the worst that ever hit northern Mexico. Water was absolutely scarce. The government was telling us, you know, you need to take uh, control of the water usage because we're out of water. Cartels learned about this shit. They say like, oh, so water is scarce now. So water is money now. So we want to control every river, creek, lake in this region, at least in the region we own. And they start doing that in, in, in Chihuahua. One anonymous cartel operative told Vice that, quote, water is now a valuable asset for us, and as it becomes more scarce, the more we will fight to make sure we have enough, end quote. There is a huge lake called um, Lago de Arareco, a beautiful lake in the, in the middle of the, of, the, of the mountains of the hills in, in Chihuahua. The last time I was there, the, I mean, it was probably only full to the third part of it. Absolutely empty. And when I asked locals, that no one wants to, wants to say what exactly was happening to the Arareco River. And they showed me how the cartels by night goes with, uh, every night goes to that creek, to that, to that lake, with these water pipes and start extracting a lot of water from, from it. And then they sell that water to hotels, stores, Airbnbs for tourists. You go to a hotel in the middle of a draft, of a draft and, 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 and you can open the the faucet and leave it open for hours and you're not gonna run out of water. But if you're in a local house, you're immediately gonna be out of water, like probably within an hour of leaving the faucet open. And all these guys are sourcing from the cartel and the cartels are making tons of money. So they are now controlling, is this, they're controlling the water supplies? Water supplies. And it makes sense. Water is the ultimate commodity. If it's scarce, then you can raise the price as much as you want without ever losing customers. But water was just the beginning. And they've already taken over so much of Mexico, the high-ranking cartel members are now close to untouchable. October 17, 2019. It was just another normal Thursday in Culiacan, Mexico, when out of nowhere, the police busted into the home of a man named Ovidio Guzman Lopez and arrested him for trafficking drugs into the US. But this wasn't just any ordinary drug dealer, though. Ovidio Guzman is the youngest son of El Chapo. He's one of the three leaders of the what we call Los Chapitos, which is the main faction of the Sinaloa cartel. A video helped take over the family business after El Chapo was extradited to the US in 2017. And he had a literal army behind him ready to kill indiscriminately until he was released. Hundreds of cartel gunmen overpowered the police almost immediately when they heard their leader had been arrested. 
They set up roadblocks. They opened fire with automatic weapons on the city with no regard for how many innocent lives they were taking. He was arrested in 2019 in Culiacan and all hell broke loose in Culiacan on what we call Culiacanazo. Hundreds and hundreds of henchmen went out the city, started fighting the government. They grabbed the families of the military members involved. There is a military base in, in Culiacan. They grabbed the families, locked them up on their houses, on the military base, and set a lot of explosives around. And they threatened the government I'd say, if you don't release a video, we're gonna kill all these families. They opened a hole on the prison, on the main state prison in Culiacan, to let a lot of, a lot of in Sinaloa cartel members in jail out, arm all the f***ers, and ask them just shoot our city everywhere and everyone. So imagine a city of less than, probably less than 300,000 people, absolutely taken by probably 100,000 people. You know, arm people around. Ovidio wasn't in custody for more than a few hours before the Mexican government was forced to cave in and release him. They were desperately begging the cartel to stop killing people. There is an estimation of the Sinaloa cartel that there's like a hundred thousand members. That's a an army because the cartel has so much power. They're like, you know what? Not only are we taking over this entire town, if you're in the military that was part of this operation, we're going after your family. I think like 29 people were killed. They took hostages. They were burning down like army barracks and stuff in the area. And the president of Mexico, he said, surely the capture of one drug smuggler could not be more valuable than the lives of innocent and civilians. It was it was a mess. So the Mexican government had to release Ovidio from their from their custody. And that that was embarrassing for the government of course and that was empowering for the for the Sinaloa cartel. So the message was clear. The government doesn't own Mexico. The cartel does. Imagine how weak and corrupt the Mexican government had to be that it couldn't even make arrest without inciting an all-out war. And if you think that sounds bad, just wait because it gets much much worse. Soon the cartel won't even have to shoot up an entire city to force the government's hand. Because just like they moved into the world of business, the biggest Mexican cartels basically are the government now. This is Abel Murrieta. Abel was a Mexican lawyer and politician for the Citizens Movement political party. In 2021, he was running for mayor in a small town called Cajeme. But unlike his opponents, Abel was very vocal when it came to speaking up against the cartels. As part of his campaign, he promised the residents of Cajeme and Mexico as a whole that if he was elected, he would fight fearlessly against the cartel's reign of terror. In a video he posted on Twitter, he said, Even with the bad guys being owners of the streets, I am a man of the law. I am going to impose order. My hand is firm, I am not scared. I think you can guess what happened next. Just one day after speaking out against the cartels, Abel was out in the streets handing out flyers in broad daylight when he was approached by two men who pulled out guns and shot him at least 10 times. To most people, it wasn't a surprise. But Abel wasn't the only Mexican politician with a target on his back. Over 150 different political candidates were murdered during the most recent election season in Mexico. Yes, you heard me right, 150. Now they have control the whole country. And now they're, they're saying like, we had elections two years ago and we had uh, over 150 candidates killed during elections. 150 politicians killed in a single election period. Wow. And that was only because cartels wanted to set up their own people. And that was a show of force. Like, if you're not stepping out, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave you out of the equation by killing you and setting up my own people. And now the cartel wants to actively take those government positions for itself. They don't want to deal with paying off politicians anymore. They don't want to deal with murdering politicians. No, the cartels want to be the politicians themselves. Because if they're the ones in charge, if they're the ones making the laws and controlling the police, why all their problems would go away. But if they have to murder every single Mexican politician in the process, they clearly will. Now they're setting up their own people, their own majors, their own governors, their own chief of police. So they don't have to pay them anymore. So they're like, okay, you don't like it, I'm gonna f pay you. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set you up as a governor of this state. And we're gonna do business, both of us. You're gonna give me all contracts for construction, for road work, for building um, government buildings, all the contracts, well, imports, exports, all of the government contracts, you're gonna give them to me. I'm gonna handle that. And that's making them tons of money because they're getting all government contracts. I don't know, man, I don't know, but it's getting out of hand.
unlike the Mafia and the Yakuza, who both have working relationships with the government officials in their countries and who knew how to hold back, the Mexican cartels have none of that mercy. So as of right now, it looks like the cartel is destined to take over Mexico and there's little to nothing we can do to stop them. Do you think it's reversible? I don't think it's reversible, to be honest. I will, I will love to say yes, but there's no f how, how will you make this backwards? You know, how, how do you de-escalate the power of these people? And not only violent power, the corruption power, the power they have in politics, they have the power they have in, into e economies. You know, Mexican economy has a lot to do with cartels. They've become completely ingrained into Mexico's everyday life and economy. They're indistinguishable from major businesses in the country. And now they're close to getting near total control of the government itself. This is so sophisticated. Yeah, they're becoming very, 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 very sophisticated. It's fascinating. I don't know how this ends. I think how it ends off the top of my head is I think one cartel would have to dominate the entire country. And when that happens, maybe, maybe there will be, maybe it will become more peaceful. I don't know, you know, because there won't be so many, so much fighting in between the different cartels and, and it's one unit running the entire operation. Yeah. I don't, I don't see it any other way. I don't see it reversing. It's not reversing. I mean, this is not a drug cartel operations now. This is, we're talking about a, a hybrid insurgency criminal movement. So solutions. On one hand, you could legalize drugs in America, but that would take the government actually creating treatment centers and stuff, or else the entire country would end up like Portland, Oregon, who would legalize everything. And let's be real, we know the government is probably not capable of pulling that off. On the other hand, the US can declare yet another endless war against the cartels that probably won't do anything but waste money and cost lives. So whether you like it or not, Mexico is de facto in the hands of the cartels now, and who knows what they're planning with their newfound power next. And you want to know what else is a failed state? America! At least when it comes to the justice system, especially when it comes to everyone's favorite private island owner, Every Jeffstein. And we expose it all in our new documentary on our new crime channel, How to Get Away With It. The Epstein case has been dirty from the very beginning. In this new documentary, we interview the journalist who was the one that published Jepstein's infamous black book that contained all of Jepstein's rich and powerful contacts, journalist Nick Bryant, and he provided a wealth of never-before-heard details on the case. There's been four presidential administrations that have covered up uh, the Jeffrey Epstein case. The Bush administration has covered it up. The Obama administration has covered it up. The Trump administration has covered it up. And now Biden is covering it up. And the cover-up is pretty immaculate. In the United States, there are 535 legislators. Um, there are 435 in the House of Representatives, and, the, and then there's 100 senators. And not one of the federal legislators has asked for an investigation of Jeffrey Epstein. So when you cover up a crime, you are aiding and abetting that crime. So the American government is aiding and abetting John trafficking. He goes over the staggering amount of evidence that shows Jepstein was working for the CIA, and I keep saying it, but this is one of my favorite videos we've made as of late, and it's an incredibly important one too. So click the card on the screen to watch now, and don't forget to subscribe. Click the card on the screen to watch now.